If you Google China today, nine out of 10 headlines will talk about its economy. Growth below expectations, sinking property prices, and impending slowdown. That's all that the world is talking about. But none of this has stopped China from targeting Taiwan. The provocations, the provocations rather continue. Last week, China sent fighter jets, bombers, and warships towards Taiwan. Over the course of three days, more than 70 Chinese planes crossed the median line. This is the de facto border between Taiwan and China, the median line. As the threat grows, the world is talking about possible scenarios, and all of these scenarios feature the U.S. What will America do to contain China? Will it go to war with China over Taiwan? What is America's military strategy vis-a-vis -vis Taiwan? These questions are being asked. Tonight, we have some answers. Tonight, we want to tell you about what's being called America's wall of defense. This is in the waters around Taiwan. The U.S. is arming allies and building military presence. To understand this wall of defense, let's first understand the lay of the land. This is the region we're talking about, East Asia, already heavily militarized with a sizable presence of U.S. forces, starting with South Korea. South Korea has about 73 U.S. bases and more than 26,000 American soldiers. Then we have Japan and double the numbers. Japan has 120 American bases with more than 50,000 U.S. troops. And these are the larger deployments. But U.S. military presence is not limited to these countries. There are bases in the Philippines, Cambodia, Singapore, Brunei, and Guam, which again is a large hub. Guam has about 8,000 U.S. troops. If you connect these dots, you'll see that the Americans have more than a foothold in the region. But that may not be enough to contain China. At least that is Washington's assessment. It remains worried about China's moves. Look at what their latest defense strategy says. It calls China the quote-unquote most comprehensive and serious challenge to the U.S. I have a copy of that report. Let me quote from what it says. The PRC is the only competitor with both the intent to reshape the international order and increasingly the economic, diplomatic, military and technological power to do it. This is the American assessment. The U.S. recognizes the threat posed by China. The question is, what will they do about it? From what we understand, the U.S. military strategy has two parts. Part one is arming allies, and part two is getting access to more bases. And this plan is already being executed. Take the case of Japan. There is complete shift in its defense posture, a complete shift there. Japan is dumping its specifist credentials. It is preparing for war with American weapons. Let me show you how. Japan is building a chain of militarized islands. It is loading them with military hardware and facilities. Take a look at this one. It's an island called Ishigaki. Recently, Japan built a garrison here. In March 2023, it also made an announcement. Japan was sending more than 500 members of the Ground Self-Defense Force. Now, that's their version of an army. Japan technically does not have an army. Their constitution does not allow it. They want to change it. But as of today, what they have is something called a self-defense force. It can only, only be used for defense. It cannot participate in an attack or an offensive operation. But as Japan shifts away from pacifism, its forces are beginning to look like a real army. The troops in Ishigaki, for instance, are being armed. They're getting 150 military vehicles and land-to-ship and land-to-air missile units. Also, America's Patriot missile system. Then we have another island called Yonaguni. It has about 160 Japanese troops. In April this year, they too got a Patriot missile system. Same with the island of Miyako. It has the first, it has in fact the same missile defense system, plus an entire military base with seven to 800 troops. And anti-ship surface-to-air missile batteries. Also radar and intelligence gathering facilities. Another island called Amami Oshima has similar deployments. Earlier this year, Japan started work on yet another island called Mageshima. Tokyo is building a military base here as well, and I have some pictures. This is what the island of Mageshima looks like. Reports say a military base is being built here. It will be used by the US military for aircraft training. A pre-existing base will be relocated here. There will be new runways, a control tower, and an explosives depot. It will be a full-fledged military facility for the US military. Now look how close it is to Taiwan and the Chinese borders. 
The goal is quite clear, to be within striking distance of China. In fact, the U.S. is getting access to more bases in the region. Recently, it struck a deal with the Philippines. It got access to four more bases, three on the island of Luzon, which is close to Taiwan, and one in Palawan. This is in the South China Sea. Now, in case you're wondering what America will do with so many bases, let me show you. This is what they're building, America's wall of defense against China. This is what it looks like. Two chains of interconnected islands, starting from Japan and South Korea in the north to Malaysia, Indonesia, and Papua New Guinea in the south. These two island chains are supposed to deter China, and this is not a new idea, by the way. It was first proposed in the year 1951 by John Foster Dulles. He later became the U.S. Secretary of State. Some 70 years back, Dulles proposed the island chain strategy. Back then, the objective was to contain both the Soviet Union and China. He wanted a string of naval bases in the Pacific to restrict access to the sea, both for Moscow and Beijing. And now, all these decades later, that plan is being revived. It may or may not work. But China will see this as encirclement, an attempt at containment, which is what it is. So expect Beijing to react sharply. In fact, it's a bit of a catch-22 situation for the world. These attempts to prevent a war might end up provoking one. So America is drawing a line in the ocean. It's their line of defense against China, military defense. But what about financial defense? That could be trickier. China is the only serious threat to America's military power. But their economic power is a different story altogether. Everyone wants a piece of it. And their biggest target, the U.S. dollar. By the way, India is on the same mission, to reduce its dependence on the U.S. dollar. Instead, India wants to use the rupee. And on Saturday, that mission got a huge boost. Prime Minister Modi was in the UAE for an official visit. After the talks, both sides made an announcement. They decided to establish a system to trade in local currencies, basically a rupee dirham trade. How would that work? Normally, bilateral trade is done in U.S. dollars. It's widely accepted all over the world. It's backed by the U.S. economy, and it's easy to exchange, the dollar. So buying and selling with the U.S. dollar makes sense. But India and the UAE are planning to remove the dollar from this equation. So Indian importers will be able to buy using rupees, and Emirati importers will be able to buy in dirhams. How does it help us? For starters, you won't use up a lot of your reserves. Those dollars can be safe in your bank. So more forex stability. And secondly, things will be less volatile. Your import bill will no longer depend on the US dollar, which is the situation right now. If the dollar rises, so will your import expenditure. Your bill goes up. You end up paying more for the same thing. The rupee dirham trade can reduce this volatility. The dollar's tantrums won't affect you, at least not as much. And India is pushing this strategy with multiple partners. Banks from 18 countries have opened special accounts in India. These include Germany, the UK, Israel, Malaysia, and Russia. So the system is very much in place. The question is how many countries are using it. Bangladesh and Sri Lanka have expressed interest. So has Indonesia now. Their finance minister is in India for G20 talks. Both countries are looking at creating a rupee, rupiah trade. Rupiah is the currency of Indonesia. Indian officials say African and Gulf nations are also keen on the rupee. The key is to translate this disinterest into deals, to sign more local currency agreements with various countries. But that's easier said than done. Look at the rupee-ruble trade, for instance. India and Russia wanted to trade in their own currencies, the rupee and the ruble. Politically, it made sense. But financially, it did not. We buy a lot from Russia, but the Russians don't buy as much from us. So Moscow would have ended up with a huge pile of unusable rupees, which is why the talks are stalled. But India is not giving up. This deal with the UA could be the boost that the rupee needs. And there are three reasons for that. One, there's a lot of money at stake. India UA trade is almost $85 billion. It is growing at 20% annually. So $100 billion is not really far off. Now, even if some of this trade is done in rupees, it will be a lot of money. Reason number two, the fuel bill. UAE is India's fourth biggest source of oil. They sell around 200,000 barrels, 200,000 barrels per day. Imagine if we could buy all of that oil in rupees. Think about how much we could save in dollar reserves. And reason number three, the remittance factor. 
Around 3 million Indians live in the UAE. They have to send money back home. The rupee dirham trade could help them by reducing the transaction cost, by reducing the settlement time, meaning you can send money faster and at better rates. And I know all of this sounds wonderful, but like with the ruble, there are challenges. You see, India has a huge trade deficit with the UAE, around $15 billion, which means we buy a lot more than we sell them. Most of it is oil. So will the UAE agree to using the rupee? Or will they also backtrack like Russia? And that is a big concern. There is some good news on that front, though. I mentioned that India has a trade deficit with the UAE. That was not always the case. Between 2014 and 2017, India, in fact, had a trade surplus with them. We sold more than we bought. So the goal is to reach that level again. Then the UAE will be more, more than happy, in fact, to take the rupee. And things are looking good on that front. They're on the right trajectory. India and the UAE signed a free trade agreement last year. Experts say Indian exports are set to double by 2027. If that happens, the rupee dirham trade could also flourish. But what about beyond the UAE? This is where things get a bit tricky. Ideally, India would want to use rupees when there is a deficit, because they can save dollar reserves. But those countries are not always willing. Case in point, Russia. Then you have countries with a trade surplus, like Bangladesh or Nepal or Sri Lanka. Those countries are more than willing to use local currencies. But, but in these cases, India may not agree. Take Bangladesh, for example. Their exports to India are around $2 billion. But their imports are around 14 billion. So Bangladesh's deficit with India is 12 billion dollars. Now assume this trade was done in rupees and takas, the Bangladeshi currency, taka. Will India be willing to accept 14 billion dollars worth of Bangladeshi takas? We only need 2 billion for trade. What will we do with the rest? That's the problem with trading in local currency. You need to strike deals with dozens of countries, some with deficits, some with a surplus. Only then can you internationalize the rupee. New Delhi has certainly scored a big win by getting the UAE on board. But the key is to build on this momentum. That's the story of Russia's invasion. More than 500 days compressed into a few seconds. It tells you the whole story. Ukraine launched a major counterattack last year. They had some success. They liberated areas in the south and the east. But that was in November 2022. Since then, very little has changed. I know the famous Russian winter has not arrived yet, but the front lines are frozen. So what are both sides doing? They're betting on unconventional attacks. We saw one in Crimea today. This important bridge between Russia and Crimea was attacked. It is called the Kerch Bridge. Two blasts were reported early on Monday. Russia says two people were killed. They have blamed Ukraine and the West for this attack. And what has Ukraine said? Well, nothing so far. It's been their strategy since last year's counteroffensive: either reject or ignore Russia. Today's attack led to traffic disruptions on the bridge. It's a key route between Russia and Crimea. Without it, moving supplies becomes difficult. So the bridge has strategic value, and this is the second time the Kerch Bridge has been attacked. The first was in October 2022. Even then, Ukraine denied attacking it. Last year, the Crimean Bridge attack was followed by a counteroffensive, a successful one. So could this attack be a repeat? Well, this time, the counterattack is already underway. Ukraine began the operation last month. Just one problem, though. It's all gone wrong. Reports say Ukraine has lost 20% of their weapons in the first weeks. 20% wiped out. And remember, these were not Ukraine's own weapons. These were weapons given to them by NATO. So what did Ukraine do? Reports say they have paused. They're rethinking their strategy. Who knows? Maybe sabotage is the new one. If so, it seems to have backfired because Russia says it has decided to halt the Black Sea grain deal. 
some context here. The Black Sea grain deal was struck last year. It permitted Ukraine to ship food grains despite the war. That deal was set to expire today. Ukraine wanted to extend it, but Russia has refused. Now, Moscow did not link it to the Crimea attack, but I'm guessing it did not help. What does this decision mean for all parties involved? Ukraine could end up losing a lot of money, no grain shipments, so no payments. The rest of the world could be in trouble too. Ukraine is one of the biggest grain producers in the world. They make up around 9% of all wheat exports. If that wheat is stuck in ports, prices will rise. There will be more inflation. Until now, the Black Sea grain deal has kept things at bay. Food prices had fallen 20% after this deal was signed last year. So if Russia does not make a U-turn, grain importers will be in trouble, especially those in Africa, which makes you wonder, what is the point of all this fighting? How does all of it end? Well, one thing's for sure, the war has single-handedly discredited most so-called strategic experts. They said Russia would win within weeks. It's day 509. They said Putin would be weakened by the Wagner mutiny. Turns out the Wagner chief had a meeting with the Russian president and that two days after the mutiny. My point is, forget the experts. Look at the battlefield reality. Russia is not losing this war at any cost, but neither is Ukraine winning. It has reached a violent and costly stalemate. The problem is, neither side will admit it. The US National Security Advisor was asked this question on Sunday. Has the war reached a stalemate? That was the question. He said no. But the counteroffensive is hard. And what is Russia saying? President Putin is showing appetite for more escalation. He has threatened to use cluster bombs in Ukraine. Listen to this. I'd like to note that the Russian Federation has a sufficient stockpile of different types of cluster munitions. Different types. We haven't done this before. We didn't use them and we didn't have to, despite of a known lack of munitions at a certain period of time. We didn't do it. But of course, if they are used against us, we reserve the right to take reciprocal action. So what next? Now would be the right time for talks to discuss terms with Russia. Both sides are reeling from battleground losses. Their people and economies are tired. Now, I know what you're thinking. If the idea was to talk, why wait until now? Why not in March last year when Russia invaded? Because now Ukraine has sent a strong and clear message. It has shown that it's not a pushover. With the right weapons, Ukrainians can and will defend themselves. And Russia knows this pretty well by now. And Kiev knows that Putin was not bluffing. He was serious about the NATO red line then, and he's serious about it now. Both sides need to start engaging. Because this war is not going to be settled in the battlefield, it needs a political settlement. Have you seen the new Mission Impossible movie? It is in the theatres. It is making a lot of buzz. If you've not seen it yet, spoiler alert. Tom Cruise, who plays Ethan Hunt, is back to saving the world from yet another villain. But this time, the villain is not a mad scientist or a ruthless assassin. It's artificial intelligence or AI. I won't give out the whole plot, but it tells you how AI is everywhere now. It is writing essays, editing photos, composing songs, and even choosing military targets. Israel is doing it, apparently. Using artificial intelligence to select targets for military strikes. It is slowly embedding AI systems in its operations. So how does it work? Well, first you feed in a huge amount of data. Everything from drone and CCTV footage to satellite imagery, electronic signals and online communications. Basically, every form of intelligence you have. You feed all of it. The machine goes through all of it. It crunches the data. And in the end, it comes up with a list of targets to strike. Basically, a list of targets that the machine recommends. And the AI model does not just select targets. It also plans the operation for you. Once you have these targets set, Another AI model jumps into action. This one is called the Fire Factory. So this AI model, the Fire Factory, takes these military-approved targets. It calculates the load of ammunition needed. It sorts them by priority. It assigns targets to aircraft and drones. And then it gives a whole schedule for the strikes. Sounds like a complete package, right? From locking targets to handling the logistics. Right now, these machines are not functioning autonomously. Every strike that the AI model suggests is being vetted and approved by a human. But this is not Israel's first time using AI in warfare. The biggest example was the Gaza War of 2021. Tel Aviv called it the first AI war. 
It used artificial intelligence to identify launch pads and deploy drones. So they've been doing it for a while. This latest move is being seen as an expansion, a new frontier in AI warfare. It may sound like an exciting development, but it also raises some very important questions. First is that of accountability. What happens if the machine orders a wrong strike? The idea for the Israeli Defense Force argues that the targets are vetted by humans. But this is just the nascent stage. What happens when these systems become fully autonomous? Who do you blame for a wrong strike? The machine or the developer? Or will you blame the officials who deployed it? Can a machine really decide who lives and who dies? That's one question. The second question is, how reliable are these systems? AI models work on the data they're fed. What if this data is flawed or biased? The end result will also be flawed. Also, how secure are these systems? What if they're hacked? What if an enemy gains control of them? It would spell disaster. Imagine rogue strikes on your own people. It sounds like a bad nightmare, but it's very much a possibility because our world is moving towards lethal autonomous weapons, AKA killer robots. Those that can identify and kill targets without human help. Sounds ominous. Thankfully, we're not there yet. But there have been instances where machines acted on their own. For example, what happened in 2020, armed drones are said to have killed a human for the first time. In 2020, the details are still sketchy, but this is according to the United Nations. A Turkish-made Cargo 2 drone hunted down members of Libya's National Army. The manufacturer says the drone can classify objects, and this allows it to fire autonomously. So the days of killer robots are not far away, which brings us to another question. Do we have rules in place to manage them? And we are not the only ones raising these questions. The United Nations Security Council is doing the same. They will meet in New York on the 18th of July. On the agenda is a formal discussion on AI. Governments want to see how they can regulate it. And this is not a new conversation. The United Nations has been pushing to ban killer robots for some time now, but countries like the United States and Russia are not on board. They say instead of a ban, there should be guidelines. And it's not every day that the US and Russia agree on something. Guess it takes killer robots to unite them. But ban or no ban, there is still no international law that regulates the use of AI in warfare. In fact, there is no single international law to regulate AI. So how do we avoid an existential disaster? Killer robots are no longer fiction. And this isn't the first time the world is facing a new technology. What we need is consensus and regulation, hopefully before the damage is done. And speaking of struggles, let me ask you something. Have you heard about the boiling frog syndrome? It comes from a fable, and this is what it says. You put a frog into a pot of boiling water, and the frog jumps right out. But if you put it in a pot of nice, tepid water, then gradually turn on the heat, the frog gets complacent and it boils to death because it doesn't feel the difference until it's too late. This story is an urban myth and a morbid one at that. But I bring it up tonight because it reminds me of a real world problem, climate change. Our world is in hot water, massive floods, extreme ocean temperatures, record heat, forest fires burning out of control, pluming smoke. A decade ago, any one of these events would have been an aberration. But now they're all happening and happening simultaneously. There is a new climate disaster every day and as depressing as it is, this is a new normal. Don't believe me? Well, brace yourselves for some truth bombs. If you're in Europe, things are really heating up. Hot weather alerts have been issued for over a dozen cities. This week, the hottest ever temperature is expected. If you're in the US, you and about 63 million others will face dangerous levels of heat. About 113 million people, that's a third of Americans, are currently under heat advisory. Specifically, if you're in California, it's going to get really bad. The Death Valley here is one of the hottest places in the world. It's nearing the hottest temperatures ever recorded on Earth. If you're in Canada, wildfires are ravaging the land. About 24 million acres have already burned. Smoke has enveloped many parts of the country. This may become the worst ever wildfire season. And stay with me because this is not all. Let's take you to Asia.
Japan has issued heat stroke alerts, affecting tens of millions of people. Many parts of the country are witnessing near record high temperatures. Meanwhile, other areas have been pummeled by torrential rain. Two extreme weather events in one country. If you're in India, you're probably braving floods and landslides caused by climate change induced monsoon. And in South Korea, floods have killed at least 40 people. Meanwhile, if you live in China, a severe tropical storm is expected as a typhoon is set to make landfall. Overwhelmed? I get it. You're not alone. But my intention is not to flood you with climatic nerves, nor am I bringing you a weather report. My one and only point is quite simple. No matter where you are, which part of the world, climate alarm bells are ringing and it's time to wake up and hear them. Because this boiling pot is only getting hotter. And with each passing day, we have a bigger price to pay. I'm talking about the cost of climate change. By 2050, it will have cost the world economy $23 trillion. Over the next five decades, this amount will increase to $178 trillion and some nations will be paying a heavier price than others. Our next report tells you more. A decade ago, this may have been just another balmy day. Today, it's a deadly heat wave. This could once have been a typical summer storm. Today, it's the cause of a fatal flood. This is the result of human-caused climate change. It's making disasters worse than ever before. We finally understand the risks this poses, how it is testing survival. But we are only now coming to terms with its economic effects. We finally understand how a warmer planet could mean a big hit to GDP. Where do the costs come from? Hotter temperatures cause crop yields to decrease. Floods destroy infrastructure like roads, which must be rebuilt. Old power grids are unable to withstand extreme climate, so new ones will have to be built, costing hundreds of millions of dollars. These are only a few examples. Climate change poses great economic issues. And by 2050, it could shave off about 14% of global economic output. That's a loss of about $23 trillion by 2050. As climate change worsens, so will the economic costs. Within five decades, this amount will increase to $178 trillion. But remember, these numbers are world totals. You see, climate change does not treat everyone as equal. By 2050, the U.S. could lose 7% of its potential economic output. Canada, Britain, France could lose 6% to 10%. These are wealthy Western nations. For poorer nations, the consequences will be worse. They will face warmer temperatures, but will have lesser ability to adapt their infrastructure. Their climate response will suffer, so their economies will take a bigger hit. Malaysia, the Philippines and Thailand could lose 20% of their estimated wealth. The economy of India could be 35% smaller. And Indonesia's economy could be 40% smaller. Big economic losses. But don't be mistaken, they're not reserved for the future. Climate costs are already shrinking our economies. Last year, Pakistan saw devastating floods. It cost them $40 billion in damages. In 2021, floods in India caused losses of $3 billion. The U.S. is increasingly spending over $1 billion on weather disasters. Back in 1980, the average time between billion-dollar disasters was 82 days. But last year, it was just 18 days. The U.S. saw 22 such billion-dollar disasters. Climate change is unleashing catastrophes. Experts say in the near future, today's disasters will seem mild. And it's clear that this will have ripple effects on our economies. So brace for more turbulence. Wimbledon has two new champions, Marketa Vondrusova and Carlos Alcaraz. Vondrusova is 24 years old, the first unseeded player to win the women's title. She was a total surprise. Last year, she was a tourist in London, nursing an injury. This year, she is a Wimbledon champion. It doesn't get better than this. Then you have Carlos Alcaraz, the 20-year-old men's champion. 
Both Von Drusova and Alcaraz are young, but that's where the similarities end. Alcaraz is the world number one. He won his first Grand Slam last year, the US Open. He is the ringleader of the new generation. The new brigade has been waiting in the wings for some time now. Federer, Nadal and Djokovic have ruled tennis longer than anyone would have imagined. Sample this. The last time Wimbledon had a men's champion outside the big four, Andy Murray being the fourth one, was in the year 2002. Over two decades ago, Alcaraz was not even born then. Three out of the four big are still playing. Only Federer has retired. While it seems like the next generation is finally ready to take its place in the sun, the question is, why has it taken them so long? You see, any sport is highly competitive, but an individual sport is also isolating. While it takes a village to raise a champion, the player is all alone in the sporting battlefield. You persevere and perish all alone on that tennis court. So it isn't just a physical battle, it's also a mental one. The gladiators of the sport, like Djokovic and Nadal, are known for this, as much for their physical prowess as for their mental acuity. You get nervous watching your favorite players play. Imagine the pressure on them. One shot could make all the difference. One shot stands between your lifelong dream and years of struggle. And talent alone will not get you there. You have to be made of, of sterner stuff. Djokovic comes from war-torn Serbia. Nadal has played with a broken thumb. Andy Murray plays with a metal hip. Federer has put in the hours, day after day, despite his prodigious talent. Monica Silas was stabbed on court while she was unstoppable. While the stabbing derailed her career, it did not deter her from making a comeback. Serena Williams won a Grand Slam while she was pregnant. Her 43-year-old sister, Venus, still plays, even with an autoimmune disease which causes joint pain and fatigue. It's a long list I could go on. In professional sport, giving up is not an option. Not even when you're losing. Not even when it's a case of so close yet so far. Not even when you can't see the light at the end of the tunnel. Not even when the tank is completely empty. Forgive me if I sound like a Nike ad, but champions just keep on going. Take Djokovic, for instance. Right after losing the Wimbledon final, he talked about a new rivalry with Alcaraz. Imagine the 36-year-old talking of a rivalry with a 20-year-old. Last evening's men's final was poignant for another reason. It had a sense of deja vu, of Wimbledon 2008. Federer was the defending champion then, just as Djokovic was now. And another Spaniard ended his reign. In 2008, it was Rafael Nadal. In 2023, it is Carlos Alcaraz. Alcaraz, like Nadal, is considered a clay court specialist, but on Sunday he changed that, taking even his opponent by surprise. And that's another thing about champions. Old or young, they have to keep reinventing themselves, adapting to different challenges. Because if the road to the top is tough, staying there is even tougher. And even then, no matter how good you are, someday someone will replace you, in sport as in life. I started by saying that the women's winner, Marketa Wondrusova, went on from being a tourist to a champion. The reverse happened to the great Roger Federer. He won the Wimbledon eight times, the most by any man. But this year, he visited as a spectator. If Von Drusova's tale is the stuff of fairy tales, Federer's is Newton's law. The rule of life, what goes up must come down. The only difference between the good and the great is the journey in between and how to make it count. So for Carlitos, as he likes to be called because he doesn't want to feel grown up apparently. The real struggle has only just begun. That is the burden of greatness. And now it's time for Vantage Shots, images that tell the story. A group of scuba divers spotted an extremely rare creature called the oarfish off the coast of Taiwan. The fish was found with mysterious holes on its body. Last week, India made history by launching Chandrayaan 3, some people got a chance to witness this moment from a plane. Meanwhile, the FIFA Women's World Cup 2023 will begin soon. An acrobatic skydiver unfurled its banner over New Zealand's Auckland and landed in Eden Park. And finally, we're taking you back in history. On this day, in 1936, the Spanish Civil War began. Troops initiated the uprising under the leadership of General Francisco Franco. The Soviet Union supported Republicans who stood by the Spanish government. Nazi Germany supported the nationalists favored by the military, who favored the military rather. Ultimately, the nationalists won. We're leaving you with that.
Thank you very much for watching. We'll see you tomorrow. Fighting, killing, go on in the desperate battle for power. The communist salute is used by everybody in Boston. And the government, though not communist itself, is used. After a hasty training of five days, recruits are rushed to the... No one can move either way without a pass. The Paramount cameraman shows his. He is allowed through. Normal, you are